Hey guys, thanks for joining us on another science edition. We're going to be continuing on with energy, specifically thermal energy today. Don't forget a couple things. We've got some homework in Schoology, temperature and heat homework. That'll be due Wednesday. And your project, the essay about comparing energies, is due on the 5th, uh, which is Friday. Please check Schoology for more detailed directions or ask me if you have questions. All right, so today, um, as a quick review, we have a question here for you today. What is the conservation of energy? How does energy transform in from one form into another? And we've got Dan's Dam, and you guys should definitely check our video links to see more about Dan's Dam and the transfer of energy. Let's check it out. Challenge to create electricity to support this beast. It's Volkswagen's carbon fiber dual engine, faster than a Formula One electric Hey, that's not Dan Stam, that's Mark Rober, and he's talking about energy conservation and transfer of energy. Let's check it out. And they gave me no further instructions on how they wanted it done, so I thought how cool would it be to charge it up using one of those science fair lemon batteries. And since I'm pretty sure using only one lemon isn't going to cut it, my plan is to build the Guinness World Record world's largest lemon battery. And when it comes to making ridiculous things, no one is better at that than fellow YouTube engineer, William P. Osmond. Oh. The first video I saw of yours was when you biohacked your dog. How did yeah, that work? Not well. We tried to dangle a hot dog in front of a dog's face on a mechanical backpack, yeah. and then you can steer the hot dog to uh, try to get the dog to change directions, and what he ended up doing was sitting down and eating them. So we've estimated this should take about three days for us to build, and yet I've only allotted two minutes for this in the video. So you know what that means. You plan on your videos working? <laughs> battery set up to just be a mangled mess of wires, so William had the brilliant idea to water jet out a bunch of copper and zinc strips, which we could then assemble into racks. We wired the first half of the racks to be in parallel, and that was in series with the second half of the racks, which were also all in parallel. And then at that point, all we had to do was impale some lemons. Speaking of which, in addition to harvesting from my own backyard, I visited some local farms and got their class two lemons, which means they couldn't be sold in stores because they were either overripe, misshapen, or too small. And when one finds oneself in possession of 1,232 lemons, turns out you can't not do this. Hey, so check out uh, Mark Rober's video on my video links to see if he could power up that electric car with the lemon powered battery. How cool. And, and as you watch, please check for all the different conservations from chemical to electrical, uh, kinetic to electrical, and, and maybe other types. So check those out. They're really cool. All right, guys. But what we're really here today to do is find out more about thermal energy, a type of energy that actually is related very closely to kinetic. So let's find our notes packet and let's start with what is thermal energy? Thermal energy, not to be confused with words like heat or temperature, is the total internal kinetic energy, which is movement, of particles of the object. So everything's made of, of atoms and molecules, and those atoms and molecules are all moving, even in a solid. They're vibrating back and forth, moving. You can feel thermal energy in action if you take your two hands and rub them together. It's almost like one hand is one molecule, one's another. And even though they're not going far, just vibrating back and forth, they're rubbing, they're touching. That's creating what? thermal energy. Okay, so it's just a way you can visualize what I'm talking about. The amount of thermal energy depends on the speed of those particles, you know, just rub your hands faster and slower, feel the difference, and the mass. So mass is related to how many of those molecules you have. So mass means you have a lot of molecules, even if they're not moving much at all, even in a solid, they are having some thermal energy. You have to add up all of those molecules motion. Let's think about this um, to, to make it make sense. If you have a bowling ball, and a ping pong ball, and you drop the bowling ball on your foot, that's got more energy than the ping pong ball. Why? Because it has so much more mass. They're both going the same speed. And then you could even throw this ping pong ball at your foot as hard as you could, increasing the speed. It still wouldn't hurt as much as that bowling ball. It would have less energy because those that mass, the mass really has a big impact on the amount of energy an object has. Same with thermal energy. Here's some water. 
water molecules, if you could see them, visualize, you know, they're flowing, they're moving, there's a little bit of space. But if we heat them up, if we add more thermal energy, we're getting those molecules to move so much faster with more energy. And to you, to your body, that feels warmer, or you're feeling the thermal energy. Here's an example, okay? The lake here, the frozen pond, has more thermal energy than the lit match. That doesn't seem to make any sense. A lit match is very hot. How can that possibly be? Well, remember, the thermal energy has to do with the, the number of molecules, not just the speed. This lake has so many more molecules, many, many, many thousands of times more molecules than a match. So even though each molecule is going slowly, if you add up all of that motion, it's more than you would have in that burning match. Kind of a cool thing. So check it out and enjoy this example. The science guy. The mountains are icy, but they've got motion of molecules. Ha! See, even cold things have heat. Things like snow and icy mountain lakes and glaciers, they've got heat. Anything with molecules has heat. It's just that the molecules in cold things are moving more slowly than the molecules in warm things. Are you with me? Okay, y'all ready? Sing along! It doesn't matter whether something feels cold or hot If molecules are moving, it's something all things got You know the words now, sing along! It doesn't matter whether something feels cold or hot Here's a question. Which has more heat energy? This hot burning match? Or this beautiful ice sculpture of science? Well. The match is hot, right? The sculpture's cold. Well, they're both made of molecules, right? But which has more molecules? Well, the ice sculpture. A lot more molecules. So although they're much colder than the match, they actually have more heat energy. More molecules, more heat energy. Think of it this way. Suppose you try to take a burning match and use it to melt the whole ice sculpture. Well, it's not going to happen, right? I mean, the match is going to run out of molecules long before the sculpture. So, more molecules, more heat energy. Ooh, ow, ow. Be careful. All right, folks, let's talk about a term that's often confused with thermal energy. That is heat. Heat is the transfer of thermal energy, which means the movement or being given from one place to another from one object to another. So if an object has thermal energy, which it does because it has internal particles that are moving, that energy will transfer to something that has less thermal energy. It's off. It's kind of like uh, if a bowling ball hits a bunch of pins. One moves and it hits the next and hits the next. So it's a form of kinetic energy. This transfer always goes from an area of high energy to an area of low energy. High energy meaning just has more thermal energy. So even if it feels cold to you, even if it's an ice cube, it still might have more thermal energy than something that's very, very cold, like liquid nitrogen. So the thermal energy from the ice cube will actually go to the liquid nitrogen. Um, put it in more common end day terms. Let's say you have a really hot pan on the stove and you touch the handle. The thermal energy from the really hot part of the pan will travel through the handle and to you. And you'll be getting that thermal energy. So heat is the transfer or movement of energy from an area where there's a lot to where there's a little. So we're going to take a look at an example of that coming right up here and brain pop. Check it out. Dear Tim and Moby, what is heat from Ashley? Is that your final answer? Is that your final answer? Yeah, you, you go phone a friend. When molecules are exposed to energy, they absorb it and become pretty active. In this excited state, they move around faster and bump into each other a lot. Temperature measures just how fast those molecules are moving. Heat measures the energy contained within an object because of its moving molecules. For example, there's a lot more heat in an iceberg than in a pot of boiling water. I'm sure the boiling water has a higher temperature, but the iceberg is a lot bigger. The molecules in the iceberg aren't moving as fast, but there are lots more of them. 
all that motion adds up to a greater heat energy. The lowest temperature you can get is absolute zero, or about minus 273 degrees Celsius. That's the point where all molecular motion freezes to a halt. Right after the Big Bang, the temperature of the universe was in the billions, and it was too hot for even molecules to form. Heating up an object can cause it to expand, because those excited molecules take up more space. Get it hot enough, and it'll melt into a liquid. With even more heat, that liquid will become a gas. Heat likes to even itself out. This radiator is on, and it's heating up the room. If we turn the radiator off, the temperature of the air in the room will gradually become uniform. Even though heat itself is energy, it takes other types of energy to create heat. Solar energy, light from the sun, sustains life on Earth. The chemical energy stored inside wood and gas gives off heat when it's burned. And speaking of chemical energy, the chemical reactions that happen inside your body also generate heat. Electricity heats up the metal wires in a toaster. Friction makes heat too, like when you rub your hands together on a cold day. Nuclear energy is stored in the nucleus of an atom, and it creates lots of heat when it's released by fission and fusion reactions. Geothermal energy is the heat that comes from deep inside the Earth, powering geysers and volcanoes. Well, Moby, can you tell us what heat is? Hey, hey, get to the point. So, if heat is the transfer of thermal energy to one object to another, then we can e easily see and measure that happening. We call this, this movement diffusion often, where something is warmer, uh, more thermal energy, transferring to something with less. Interestingly enough, that means there's no such thing as cold energy. You notice we didn't define cold or cold energy. It's just the absence of heat, the absence of the movement of thermal energy. So if you leave your door open and someone says you're letting in all the cold air, you can say to them, no, I'm just transferring the, the, the thermal energy from the warm air to the cold air that's coming in from the outside. There is no cold. It's just less and less heat. Now, can you uh, cool something down? Can you remove all of the thermal energy? to a place where there's no thermal energy? In other words, there's no motion? In an ice cube, even though you've, you've frozen the water, you've slowed it down so much the molecules aren't technically moving? They are. They actually are. Molecules are always moving, even just vibrating back and forth, just a little bit. So could you remove all of the thermal energy? Well, it just so happens that theoretically you can. And the idea of that gives us the idea of absolute zero, which is a temperature where there's no motion of molecules. Can you imagine such a place? Maybe outer space? Well, it turns out the coldest place in the universe is actually in labs where they're trying to achieve absolute zero. No one's actually achieved it, but we've gotten within about a billionth of a degree, but we can't stop every molecule from moving. Let's check it out. Absolute zero is the holy grail of temperatures. But even though we know exactly how cold that is, negative 273.15 degrees Celsius, reaching it has eluded us for centuries and will continue to elude us probably forever. For this frustration, we have to thank Sir William Thompson, first Baron Kelvin, who in the mid 1800s tested a new theory that heat is just molecules moving around in a substance. So we wanted to get stuff as cold as he could get it. So he conducted experiments that drew heat from a warm substance toward a cooler one and found that at some point all the kinetic energy could be drained from the warm substance. It could no longer be cooled any further. This temperature wasn't like melting points or boiling points which change for every substance. It was the same for everything. So Kelvin created a thermodynamic temperature scale that measured the amount of kinetic energy within any given material, and we still use his Kelvin scale today. But ever since Kelvin's day, scientists have been trying to chill stuff to absolute zero, and no one has succeeded. All a bunch of failures, because it turns out 
quantum mechanics is involved, which means it's really complicated. Physicists know that absolute zero does not mean a complete absence of motion in a substance. Instead, zero degrees Kelvin marks the state of minimal motion of a substance particles. That's because of Heisenberg's... Well, if you're interested in finding out more about absolute zero, please click the video links to see the rest of this exciting video on absolute zero and a whole bunch of other stuff about thermal energy, heat, and temperature. Let's move on in our notes to the next section about temperature. Speaking about temperature, what is that? Temperature is a human-made idea, a measurement, okay, that, that people have made up, and it could involve any types of numbers that you want. It just so happens we use three scales quite commonly. It's a measurement of that average thermal energy of an object based on the expansion of materials, like mercury, as they're heated. So what do I mean by that? Well, mercury, an element, has certain properties, and as you apply heat, thermal energy is transferred to mercury, the molecules move faster and they spread out and they expand. It's common for quite a few materials. Mercury is particularly good at this and it will expand in a constant rate no matter what the temperature. So uh, what we can do is get a, a glass container or tube, have some mercury in it, and as that mercury is heated, as thermal energy transfers into it, it expands and has nowhere to go but up the tube. And you can put numbers on the side of your tube to indicate whatever temperature scale you want. Uh, in modern thermometers, we use alcohol, which is a little less toxic than mercury if it were to break. We have Fahrenheit, we have Celsius, and a scale newly developed that involves that absolute zero. As you guys can see, the Fahrenheit scale, zero is about negative 20 Celsius, whereas 32 is zero degrees Celsius. And if you live back several hundred years ago, you would see many different temperature scales, different countries, even different labs had different scales and different ways of measuring it. Everyone trying to come up with the right units or, or the ones that everyone would love to use. And please watch the video about temperature scales to see more about some really interesting scales with tons of different scales, different uh, number values put on them um, by different people and, and sometimes having to use it all at once. Very confusing. Well, let's look at the three scales we use mostly today in modern times, okay? We've got Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. Fahrenheit, you've heard the word degrees. Well, that was based on the 360 degrees of a circle. So imagine a round shape with a pointer that can move. Every degree you move on your circle is a degree of temperature. Quite ingenious. The Celsius scale was quite ingenious as well. It started at zero being the freezing temperature of water and 100 boiling, and then just put 100 marks in between. Then anyone basically can make their own thermometer scale because everyone can get a hold of freezing and boiling water. And Kelvin is when we use the absolute scale, where zero would be that lack of motion. It turns out to be about negative 273 Celsius. Going back to that Fahrenheit, interestingly enough, the difference between the freezing and boiling points of water is 180 degrees. If you think about it, when you do a 180, you're doing one complete turn where you're faced completely opposite of where you're facing before. So that's kind of a poetic turn, so to speak. Okay, last thing to do, I want you guys to go ahead and find an example of thermal energy that's being transferred as heat and then what we would say is it's lost. The efficiency of something is going down because of heat. Let me give you an example. Um, your car or bus, the engine is warm. That energy, that heat, that thermal energy is actually not great for your bus because those moving parts are creating friction, which are being quite inefficient. You want all that motion to go into to moving the wheels. You want that gasoline chemical energy to turn completely into kinetic energy to move the wheels, but some of the energy is lost or transferred as heat. Hard to recover and it's actually uh, draining from your, from your overall energy of your bus. So take a look and see if you can find any of your own. Lots of chances for heat energy, thermal energy, turning to heat to sort of suck away some of the energy of a, of a machine or, or anything really because as energy is transferred in the example of our roller coaster here, the potential to kinetic, back to potential, there's this mechanical energy, and remember, the rails and wheels are touching. And so friction 
is going to generate heat, which is going to, we could say, lose some of that um, that motion energy. Of course, it's just being transferred into heat, but since it's hard for humans to recover and use things like heat and sound, um, which are both, again, kinetic forms of energy, we often say that energy was lost. Well, folks, hope that lesson on thermal energy was interesting. Don't forget to check the video links for, for many videos that are, are very highly captivating if you're interested in, in temperature scales and where they came from. I highly recommend you check those out. Um, please work on your project, Energy in the News, or your, your homework, which also can be found on Schoology. And if you get a chance, go out in your backyard and enjoy some of the thermal energy of your rink. All right, guys. Hey, thanks for trying science, and we'll see on the next one. Bye for now.